Welcome. This is Best Practices for Co-Teaching to Enhance the Learner Experience, as presented at the Office of Special Education and Early Learning's Directors of Special Education, or DOSE Institute, September 7th through the 9th in 2022. My name is Allison Johnson. I work for the Kentucky Department of Education in the Office of Special Education and Early Learning, OSEAL, as an exceptional child consultant. My name is Natasha Menifee. I work at the Kentucky Department of Education, Office of Special Education and Early Learning, and I am the Guidance and Support Branch Manager. So our objectives are to inform participants about the benefits of co-teaching, to increase participants' familiarity with co-teaching best practices, and introduce participants to resources and effective solutions for common barriers to effective co-teaching. So let's look at some of the reasons why we co-teach. Why is co-teaching beneficial? During our time, during the session, there was a lot of good discussion with regards to the reasons why we co-teach. Some of those top responses were, Co-teaching keeps students in their least restrictive environment. Co-teaching exposes students to grade level content and time with their peers. And co-teaching is good for all students, not just special education students. So let's pause and reflect. Looking at the diagram on the screen, we have four models for a classroom and four labels integration, segregation, exclusion, and inclusion. Take some time to look at each model and determine which model best matches the label. For classroom model A, this is a representation of exclusion. As you can see, all the green dots are in the circle and all the red, yellow, and blue dots are outside of the circle, representing an exclusion model of co-teaching. For classroom model B, this is a representation of inclusion. While the students that are the multicolored dots representing a special education group of students are in the classroom, they are still grouped only within themselves. So they, while they are in the classroom, they are still not engaging with their grade level peers. Model C resembles integration, where we have general education and special education students in the classroom integrated together. And then we have model D, which would be segregation. Not only are the students not in the not with in their same level peer with their grade level peers they are outside of the classroom and not engaged in any grade level content or interaction with their peers um, model c is the goal model for co-teaching where students are in the classroom getting exposure to grade level content as well as interaction with their grade level peers. So when thinking about co-teaching, we also need to think about the least restrictive environment. Kentucky regulation states that an LEA or a local educational agency shall ensure that to the maximum extent appropriate, children with disabilities are educated with children who are non-disabled. So co-teaching is part of the continuum of services and should be considered when deciding a student's least restrictive environment. And now we're going to discuss co-teaching best practices. When we look at the basic elements of co-teaching best practices, Weiss and Glazer did a really interesting research study and they found that there's three main elements of really good co-teaching. Really good co-teaching starts 
with quality general education instruction. This is high quality content instruction, including evidence-based practices and high leverage practices from that content area. For example, this would be class-wide tier one instruction using evidence-based practice strategies to teach early literacy. Once you have that quality general education instruction for good co-teaching, you need to layer on evidence-based practices from special education. And these are still geared for the whole group to improve accessibility for all students. For example, in that early literacy classroom, perhaps you add in the evidence-based practice from special education of explicit instruction, where you're gaining the student attention, modeling, guided practice, and then moving into independent practice. Once you have those two layers, for really quality co-teaching practices, you add on the final third tier of specially designed instruction. This is intentionally provided differentiated instruction for students based on their individual needs and goals as written in their IEPs. So in that same early literacy classroom where we're using evidence-based practices from literacy, and then we're layering on evidence-based practice of explicit instruction, you would then add in specially designed instruction for specific students directly related to their IEP reading goals, for example, oral reading fluency. And those three components layered in that way are really the most effective basic way to approach co-teaching. Now, within that co-teaching classroom, of course, there are co-teaching partners. And we want to take a moment and really break down the different roles of the co-teaching partners because you have the general education teacher and the special education teacher. And although they work together and in unison, the specific duties of each of them are slightly different. So the general education teacher, the content area teacher, is responsible for leading the lesson planning and initial instruction for the Kentucky Act Academic Standards in that content area. If I'm a math teacher, I'm responsible for teaching all of the math standards. The special education teacher, on the other hand, leads the planning and designing initial delivery and progress monitoring of the specially designed instruction and any behavioral interventions for those special education students in that general education classroom. Now, the special education teacher will adapt the curriculum as necessary, but that general education teacher is still responsible for that initial instruction in the content area. Now, they both support one another. The general education teacher will support the implementation of specially designed instruction, including progress monitoring. It is led and initiated by the special ed teacher, but the general education teacher absolutely has a role in supporting that work. Similarly, the special education teacher will reinforce that initial instruction in the Kentucky Academic Standards, perhaps providing extra practice or adding in some of those evidence-based practices like we discussed in the last slide. And then jointly, together, the general education and special education teacher implement all of the student accommodations and supplementary aids and services as outlined in student IEPs. Now, there are some specific considerations for special education teachers. Again, special education teachers must provide the initial delivery of specially designed instruction or SDI. General education teachers and paraprofessionals can absolutely supplement and aid in that delivery, but it must be monitored and initially provided by special education teachers. And then this is a common issue that comes up. Special education teachers may only provide special education services to students identified with a disability under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act or the IDEA. Now, if the special education teacher is already performing services or duties on an IEP, Students without disabilities may benefit, it's called an incidental benefit, from those services. So for example, if I'm a special education teacher in a co-taught class and I'm already providing 
weekly small group grade level reading instruction, and I'm just doing it at a slower pace for my students' IEPs, students without disabilities in that class could absolutely participate in that slower paced reading group because I'm already providing it. For more information in the references section at the end of these slides, um, there's a really great policy letter from the Office of Special Education Programs, also known as OSEP at the federal level, that goes into more detail about what exactly is permissible in this incidental benefit. So now let's look at the types of co-teaching models available to classroom teachers. First, we have whole group approaches. That is one teach, one observe. We have one teach, one assist, and teaming. Small group approaches to co-teaching are station teaching, parallel teaching, and alternative teaching. So let's look at one teach, one observe, or assist. This looks like one teacher leading instruction, while the other observes students for either behavior, engagement, or collecting data, or assisting with prompting and cueing or other individual supports. Some things to consider with this model is the assisting teacher can identify students who need support quickly. They can assist in collecting progress monitoring data, but it's also valuable to note that this is a model that is easy to overuse. This model um, is good for introducing new content. For example, in a science class, this would be a great model to use while one teacher leads the new content and the other teacher assists and provides supports to those students who need it. Again, as I said, to keep in mind, it is easy to overuse and should not be the default because it does set up one teacher, usually the special education teacher, as the teaching assistant instead of a fully qualified teacher. Um, it's best to think critically about when using this model and to plan ahead with what each role will look like when one teacher is leading and one teacher is observing or assisting. The next model we want to look at is teaming. Teaming is when both teachers share instruction simultaneously. Some things to consider with this model is it may require significant preparation. It requires a shared vision of the instruction. And it also provides all students with multiple perspectives. One teacher provides the content and the second teacher models a think aloud or note taking or asking questions in in a teaming situation. Again, this is a model that does require significant preparation. And then for our small group approaches, we start with station teaching. And this looks like content and instructional tasks divided into stations and small groups of students rotate through the stations. Now, these stations will include both teacher-directed activities from both teaching partners and independent or structured group activities. And that leads us directly into something to consider. For station teaching to be effective, students must work independently at least some of the time. Also, you'll have to consider that each station will need consistent timing. This can be a little bit flexible if, for example, you have one task that is much longer. Students can work on it through two stations, um, but timing is definitely a consideration. And station teaching does require significant preparation. Um, it's also important to consider your grouping because you will need some intentional grouping and thinking through so that you have students working on the skills that they need to be working on at the same time. That requires significant pre-planning. Um, and just a reminder for the roles of teachers within station teaching, special ed teachers cannot introduce new content, although they can review old content, um, but they can also provide only the incidental benefit. And I urge you again to read that letter from OSEP that is referenced at the end of the slides. This is a good opportunity to provide specially designed instruction within the general ed setting. It just requires some careful planning. <laughs> 
Another small group method of co-teaching is parallel teaching. And this is when students are divided into two groups, typically relatively equal in size, and each group is led by one partner teacher. The groups are receiving the same content at the same time, but instructional strategies may be the same or may differ between the two groups. This is a great opportunity for differentiation, but again, it requires some thinking ahead and intentional grouping. So one really good example um, in a math classroom, if you are parallel teaching and we're all working on systems of equations, one group could get extra practice at solving systems by substitution, while another group gets some enrichment or moves faster and works on solving systems by, say, graphing or elimination. <clears throat> this could also look like in a history classroom, one group learning note taking skills using visual notes and the other group learning outlining, but they're all looking at the same content. And for our last method of co-teaching, model of co-teaching, we have alternative teaching. This looks like one teacher is instructing the large group while the other teacher is instructing a small group for a specific purpose. Again, as with all of the rest of these models, you really have to consider your intentional grouping. But in this model, it's really important to vary the purpose and leader if the small group. If that small pullout group is only used for specially designed instruction or remediation, it can be stigmatizing for students. So an example of what this might look like in a classroom is a large group could be working on an extension activity while a small group is pre-taught vocabulary for an upcoming lesson. Or a large group works on additional skill practice independently um, and the small group works on some sort of extension or enrichment activity instead. So for the last section of this presentation, we're going to look at common barriers and potential solutions for effective co-teaching. So in the in-person session, we completed an activity about what are common barriers to effective co-teaching. Um, we had participants brainstorm individually and then together and categorize all of the barriers that they came up with um, into several different groupings, such as ideas, beliefs, communication, time and scheduling. Um, once all of those were brainstormed, we then moved on to thinking through possible ways of addressing these barriers um, and brainstorming possible solutions, or at least, again, mechanisms for addressing and helping some of those barriers. There was a lot of great discussion. And so in the next couple of slides, we have gathered together some of the themes from that discussion to share with you all. So some of the common barriers that came out of that discussion were a lack of time to co-plan. As stated earlier in the presentation, many of the models require significant planning. So some of the common barriers to effective co-teaching were a lack of time to co-plan with the general education teacher and the special education teacher. Scheduling was another common barrier to co-teaching, whether that was the scheduling of the special education student and their schedule or the teacher's schedule that, that posed a conflict to effective co-teaching. Um, so scheduling was a common barrier discussed during the group. There was lack of content knowledge. So lack of content knowledge from the special education teacher who may not be as familiar with the general education content and due to the time, the lack of time to co-plan, some special education teachers reported they did not feel as confident supporting the general education instruction in specific content areas. Another common barrier was the perception that spe the special education teacher is an aid and not an equal in the classroom. So this is a common barrier 
that addresses um, that working relationship between the general education teacher and the special education teacher, which is so important for effective co-teaching to take place in the classroom. Another part of that is the lack of or ineffective communication. So we know that plays into the working relationship between the general education teacher and special education teacher. So when there is ineffective communication or little to no communication, um, it can pose as a barrier to co-teaching instruction. Another barrier were differences in teaching styles. So when you have the general education teacher with a teaching style and the special education teacher with a different teaching style, there has to be some common ground in the middle for effective co-teaching to take place. And that can be um, a barrier that pre prevents two great teachers from being able to effectively co-teach together. And finally, another uh, barrier shared was the lack of a shared understanding of what co-teaching is. So what co-teaching truly is, what those models are and how to teach effectively within a specific model. So a lack of a shared understanding of co-teaching and co-teaching models is a barrier to effective co-teaching in the classroom. So after our participants brainstormed common barriers to co-teaching, we also had long discussions about how we might address those barriers to co-teaching. And these were some of the um, ideas that were put forward by our participants. So as noted, common planning or a lack of common planning is really a hindrance to effective co-teaching. And so we had a number of people suggest using digital collaboration spaces for asynchronous planning. So using those digital spaces like Google Documents or shared Microsoft Documents with real-time asynchronous planning so that if, for example, the general education teacher shares their lesson plan, the special education teacher can see that ahead of time and begin building familiarity with the content and sharing within that document what SDI or other differentiation might be appropriate for that student population. Another item that came up often was to really pull in building administration when looking at planning and scheduling needs, both for students and for staff, because as we know, planning in terms of setting schedules typically happens with our principals and other building level administrators, and so it's important to include them in these conversations. As noted with the digital collaboration spaces, we also heard a lot that sharing those education plans in advance with the special education teacher is really, really helpful in building that familiarity with the content. Similarly, in order to help build familiarity with the content and improve communication, it came up often that keeping co-teaching pairs together over time from year to year as much as possible was really helpful because then they both built familiarity with each other, but also that helped the special education teacher gain knowledge in the content area and that general education teacher gain knowledge in how to better assist our students with disabilities. Now, we did have folks note that that is not always possible. We just know realistically it's not always possible to keep our co-teaching teacher pairs together. But if it's not possible, at least try to keep the special education teacher in the same content area, again, to help build that familiarity with the content area in order to improve co-teaching. Finally, another item that came up often was to provide training on effective co-teaching practices for all of our staff, not just our special education staff, but also our general education teachers who will be co-teaching. Some directors of special education reported greater success with co-teaching when they focused on implementing one or two co-teaching models at a time and building efficacy with those models and then adding in additional models as they are mastered. So that's definitely something to consider.
Here we have a few additional resources if you want a, more information. These first two videos from the IRIS Center um, really look at those individual elements of successful co-teaching. And then of course we have high leverage, pract high leverage practices in special education from the CEDAR Center um, and the CEC, Council for Exceptional Children. And it goes, again, those high leverage practices in special education are a really important component of co-teaching. And finally, we have a question and answer document um, looking at collaborative teaching, collaborative teaching practices for exceptional children. These are the references we use throughout this slideshow. In particular, take a look at that Office of Special Education Programs policy letter for that incidental benefit information. And if you have questions or other concerns, please contact one of us at these email addresses and we will be happy to help.